Welcome everyone, my name is Tanya Hood and it is my pleasure to provide you with introductions for this meeting. It is being held between the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, hereafter being referred to as the NRC. This meeting is to provide information related to emergency preparedness and security requirements for the nuclear power reactor facilities as it relates to those undergoing decommissioning. This meeting is scheduled from 3 p.m. until 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a question and answer session that allows attendees an opportunity to ask questions of the NRC staff or make comments about the issues discussed throughout the meeting. However, the NRC is not actively seeking comments towards regulatory decisions at this meeting. This meeting is being hosted virtually through the use of Microsoft Teams. Should you have trouble with the Teams application, I recommend that you first Use the Microsoft Team link that has been provided in the meeting notice, as opposed to the Microsoft Teams app. If you still have difficulty, then disconnect and try to reconnect to the Teams meeting. Or if you're using the telephone, it is easier to use the telephone conferencing number that has been listed in the public meeting notice. The Teams meeting has been set up, as I stated previously, as a webinar, so microphones are disabled for the moment. When we get to the question and answer portion of this meeting, at that time, please type your questions in the chat box so that we can share them when we arrive. I will start with the questions and comments that are in the chat box and then go to the phone lines. If you're on the phone, I'll ask you to come off of mute and share your questions or comments when we arrive at that portion of the meeting. I will then provide more instructions about how you can do so at that time. At this point, I'll take a few moments to introduce a few participants for this session and then turn it over to Sean Anderson, Chief for the Reactor Decommissioning Branch and the Division of Decommissioning Uranium Recovery and Waste Programs from the Office of Nuclear Materials Safety Safeguards. Today, we have Jesse Kichuchu, Chief of the Reactor Licensing Branch and the Office of Nuclear Security and Incidents Response, Doug Garner, Security Specialist in the Materials Security Branch. And we also have other participants that are from the NRC staff that will introduce themselves when they are ready to speak. At this time, I want to let you know that if you are want to send information regarding to feedback to this meeting, you will be able to provide that information to me via email and I will share a slide at the beginning and at the end of this meeting so that you can be aware of where to receive your meeting feedback forms. Now, I will turn the meeting over to Sean Anderson for our opening remarks. Sean? Thanks, Tanya. Uh, appreciate it and um, thanks for everyone else for joining us today. I just want to provide a little bit of context between, you know, I guess from why we're here and you know, in the recent months, we there's been a lot of increased interest from members of the public, state representatives, advisory panels related to emergency preparedness and security reviews as it related to decomm decommissioning activities, um, even the exemptions and some of the requirements. And, you know, we've been providing numerous written responses and um, verbal responses to questions regarding some of our licensing reviews and also inspections in that area. And we thought, you know, this might be a good opportunity just to, you know, let's have a webinar to provide some of this background and some provide some of the context um, to a more broad audience. So uh, we thought this would be a good way, a good opportunity to provide some of that feedback. And, you know, we're also welcome, always welcome some of the feedback and from the uh, members that are, are stakeholders and members of the public. So after the meeting, feel free to provide some of the feedback to this session as part of the meeting feedback forms. And we'll also provide, um, we're also providing, uh, presenting at the New York State Decommissioning Oversight Board um, regarding some of the intimacy questions, uh, specific activities at um, Indian Point on December 7th. So uh, with that, you know, I just want to uh, thank everyone for coming here again and we can transition over to um, Jesse. We'll start off the presentation. All right, uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jesse Kitschu, and I am the uh, chief of the reactor licensing branch in the Office of Nuclear Incident and Security Response. Um, uh, I'd like to take a moment to describe uh, you know, what I oversee. Um, I oversee the technical reviews of emergency preparedness uh, amendments uh, to NRC licenses uh, from a, a variety of, uh, of licenses. Uh, we're talking decommissioning, operating reactors, research and test reactors, 
medical facility isotopes, uh, production facilities. So uh, my branch really uh, oversees a large amount of um, uh, eMERGE preparedness uh, reviews. Uh, with me uh, attending today is Michael Norris. He's one of our senior emergency preparedness specialists um, and has, uh, gosh, over 30 years of experience in emergency preparedness. Uh, thank you for those of you taking the time to attend this meeting. Uh, next slide. All right. Um, when the NRC approves an operating license, licensees are required to establish emergency plans that provide reasonable assurance that adequate protection measures can and will be taken to protect public health and safety in the event of a radiological emergency. It is important to note that NRC emergency preparedness regulations do not distinguish between an operating reactor and one that is permanently shut down and defueled. Uh, next slide. Uh, we're on slide five, I believe. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, the NRC mission is focused on uh, safety of the public. As such, these emergency plans that are established for operating reactors uh, provide capabilities to mitigate potential radiological events, on-site emergency planning that provides classification of emergencies, notification of off-site government authorities, and coordination of off-site organization response, to name a few. Uh, next slide. After the plan is shut down, the risk associated with potential accidents is significantly reduced. This is because the majority of the risks during plan operation is when the reactor is in operation, um, in use. Since the current NRC emergency planning regulations do not distinguish between an operating reactor and one that is permanently shut down and defueled, the exemption process is used to seek regulatory relief commensurate with the risk at a facility while ensuring reasonable assurance to public health and safety. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the life cycle of an operating reactor plant from the point of fuel in the reactor vessel fuel in spent fuel pool, and finally in dry cast storage on the horizontal line at the bottom of the figure, compared to the real, relative radiological risk on the vertical line. As you can see in this figure, when the fuel is in the spent fuel pool in preparations for and during decommissioning, the radiological risk become extremely lower as compared to when the fuel is in the reactor vessel during normal reactor operations, and another step lower when the fuel is moved to dry cast storage. Next slide, please. This slide identifies the regulations that licensees use for exemptions to seek regulatory relief. I do want to point out that unlike license amendments where licensees must comply and meet regulations, the exemption process is one where licensees are seeking regulatory relief. One of the underlying purposes for exemptions is because the regulations as written may not be necessary to achieve the underlying purpose. I'll provide an example of this later in, uh, in my presentation. Next slide, please. So going back to what I said previously, when an operating license is issued, is issued and an emergency plan is approved, because of the lower risks at the site and as a plan enters decommissioning, licensees would submit an exemption from NRC regulations. When a, an exemption is requested by a licensee and once approved by the NRC, the NRC reduces the requirements consistent with the risk of the facility and approves a permanently defueled emergency plan. The exemptions would remove operating reactor emergency action levels such as automatic reactor trips, uh, inability to shut down a reactor, but would, still keep, uh, but would still keep some emergency action levels associated with the configuration of the plant during the decommissioning, such as a uh, spent fuel pool accident. The emergency preparedness requirements for wet and dry storage are the same in Part 72. Thus, when you go from a wet, uh, wet uh, spent fuel pool to a dry cast storage, uh, exemptions are not necessary. Next slide, please. 
All right. Um, a few of the significant uh, considerations during the NRC staff technical review are shown on this slide. Uh, traditional accidents that are on that are the most risk to the plant are no longer applicable, such as uh, loss of coolant accident, um, steam generator uh, tube rupture. Uh, the risk to the public is more focused on fuel handling accident and cast drop. Um, two months after shutdown, radio iodine has decayed away and no longer a concern. Uh, when fuel is in the spent fuel pool, there is no driving force like an operating reactor to force the water out. So the focus would be on ensuring leakage from the spent fuel pools are addressed. And because these events evolve slowly, the NRC ensures the emergency plan provides mitigation measures and if necessary, adequate time to conduct protective actions. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, slide shows the studies performed for uh, spent fuel pool events. Uh, in 2000, the NRC went into rulemaking for decommissioning reactors and issued new reg 1738 as its regulatory basis. Uh, the staff uses this regulatory basis as part of our evaluation for exemptions. Uh, this rulemaking was stopped uh, due to events of 9-11 and other agency priorities in 2001. Uh, more recently, the NRC performed and issued a study on how earthquakes affect spent fuel pools, uh, new reg 2161, which provided results that are consistent with earlier research conclusions that spent fuel pool are robust structures that are likely to withstand severe earthquakes without leaking. The NRC continues to believe, based on this study and previous studies, that high density storage of spent fuel in pools protects public health and safety. Um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, this table is here to show a few of the differences of what is contained in an emerging preparedness plan uh, between an operating reactor and a decommissioning site. For example, an operational reactor has a formal off-site radiological emergency preparedness plan with its focus on prompt protective actions for the public versus an off-site response from first responders, medical and law enforcement to the site. In the highly unlikely event at a decommissioning site, should protective action be needed to protect the public, a comprehensive plan is in place to similar to a hazardous waste traffic accident, for example. Another example is the difference in event classifications where classifications for operating reactors may lead up to a general emergency. However, for a decommissioning site, the highest level may be an alert. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this figure provides a pictorial that shows an emergency planning zone for a typical operating reactor. Uh, an emergency planning zone is a tool to aid implementing predetermined prompt action. Uh, during decommissioning, sufficient time is available to mitigate the accident or initiate protective actions as conditions warrant without the aid of an emergency planning zone. Uh, next slide. Uh, the figures here shown, uh, figure shown uh, illustrates the difference of an emergency planning zone at an operating reactor measured in miles on the bottom right of the slide uh, compared to the boundary at a decommissioned facility measured in meters on the top left. Uh, the smaller size boundary is based on lower radiological risk at this uh, decommissioned facility. Next slide. Uh, here, uh, is, since 2014, uh, is a list of nuclear power plants that the NRC issued exemptions uh, for where the staff sought commission approval. And um, this would uh, conclude my presentation. Uh, Tanya, back to you. Thank you so much for that, Jesse. And now we will have a security presentation from Doug Gunner. And after we have that presentation, we will go to the questions and comments from the public. We thank you so much for your time and your patience. Doug? Hi, can you toggle the slides, please?
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Doug Garner. I'm a security specialist in the material security branch of the Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. My roles and responsibilities in the branch primarily related to reviewing ISOC security plans, any license amendments or requests that licensees may submit, and evaluating those. Similar to emergency preparedness, all licensees are required to establish security plans which provide reasonable assurance that adequate protective measures can and will be taken to protect the public health and safety. These security requirements are contained in 10 CFR 7355, requirements for, for the physical protection of licensed activities and nuclear power reactors against radiological sabotage and NRC security orders. It's important to note that the physical security regu regulations do not distinguish between an operating reactor and one that is permanently shut down or defueled. Next slide, please. This slide shows a regulatory approach as a licensee transitions from an operating power reactor to a dry storage independent spent fuel storage installation or SOC. A licensee notifies the NRC of permanent cessation of operations in accordance with applicable regulations. During this time, 10 CFR 7355 and the NRC securers still apply. And the protective strategy remains exactly the same as an operating reactor while the fuel is in remains inside the spent fuel pool. Fuel is only moved and stored on site to the in the ISOC when appropriate conditions are met. Next slide, please. This slide initiate it indicates that the scope of the physical security protections are based solely on safety functions that remain and it must be protected. Licensees are required to maintain a security force on site that is equal to the threat to the spent fuel pool, spent fuel. And a licensee, they can request licensing actions or exemptions to modify the security plant program for the protection of the pool. Licensees will continue to conduct inspect, the NRC continues to conduct inspections for uh, the security requirements and ensure that they are met, including inspections, evaluate any changes to the security posture. Cyber, cyber security protections are gradually, gra gradually reduced as safety and security and emergency preparedness systems are moved from, from service. The cyber security rule, or 10 CFR 7054, is no longer applicable after cessation of operation letters have been submitted. However, the, by condition of the license, the requirement remains in place. The licensee may submit a license amendment requesting the removal of the cyber security license condition after all the fuel is moved to the spent fuel pool and has been sufficiently cooled. The licensee must pro provide, provide protection for the ISOC until all fuel is removed from the site. NRC approved physical security plan and post 9-11 security orders are in place to enhance the security. There are no cybersecurity requirements for an SVC. And I'll, and I'll just jump in here. I think um, just want to summarize a couple of aspects here and, and just touch on the inspection program itself. Um, just a reminder, NRC, we established an inspection program from the beginning of, from the site, from construction, and it goes all the way until the license is terminated. So as long as there's fuel on site, um, the NRC is going to continue to inspect throughout the commissioning for both the security requirements and the EP requirements. Um, so our inspectors have conducted several inspections over decommissioning and ISP programs for, the, for many years. And our inspection program remains robust and contain or in, in, sorry and continues to assure risk informed safety focused areas and that the inspection focus is, des is designed to effectively monitor licensing performance licensees performance and next slide and i know the team and and, and uh everyone has already covered this especially jesse and, and doug but some of the just a summary quick points here is just to remember that the ep and security requirements are not being eliminated um, they're just being adjusted based on the overall risk and licensees must maintain an emergency plan 
and physical requirements remain in place. Um, if the seas are secured 24 seven, uh, 365 days of the year. And again, periodically throughout the year, uh, throughout the life of the license, the NRC will continue to provide our independent oversight and inspections through license termination. And I'll pass it back to Tanya and see if we uh, get some questions queued up from members of the public. So much for that, Sean. At this time, I want to let those in the public know that you have the opportunity to type your information inside of the chat box. We are now at the question or portion of this meeting. So we want to let you know that as you type your information into the chat box, I will begin sharing the questions or comments that you have at that time. Once I've completed the discussions that's inside of the chat, I will then go to those that are on the phone. Um, at this time, I want to let you know that as we go through this presentation, let me share really quick on the screen, how you can as a member of the public when you're on the phone, be able to participate and letting me know by raising your hand. For those that have called in, we want you to participate in this meeting. You can see from the information and directions that's currently on the screen that you raise your hand by selecting star five. Once you do so, wait about four seconds, then you can unmute yourself by selecting star six. You will then get the opportunity to speak into the meeting and I will have that, I will know who at that point will be able to participate in that discussion. This time I will pause for a few moments and then go to the chat box so I can read those questions that we have from the members of the public. And thank you so much for the NRC team that is supporting the chat with me. Here we have a message from Tina Bonger. I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. Says the NRC OIG determined that the risk method about the AIM pipe plans were, de were deficient. The NRC has not provided oversight for the proper risk assessment of the AIM pipelines and plant. How has the NRC done an adequate emergency preparedness plan that doesn't include any kind of gas pipeline rupture at site? Major proponents, and I'm not able to read other things that was written in that one. Currently inside of the NRC staff that would like to address that question. Now, this is something that I know that we can take back because I want you to also be mindful that as we go through the discussion points in this meeting, we will do our best to ensure that we address as many questions as possible in the allotted time. But if we are not able to get to your comments or questions, please be mindful that we will get the opportunity as a staff to look at them after the meeting. Mike Norris, Mike Norris will take that question. Yeah, this is Mike Nars again, as I was in uh, Jesse indicated, I'm a senior emergency preparedness specialist here at the NRC. Um, the emergency action levels are based on hazards for the spent fuel and it and it doesn't matter what the, the cause of the event was. It's the results of the event that the emergency action levels are based on. So with respect to an ISPACY, a, a dry cast storage installation, if there's an event, whatever type of event happens, if it causes a breach of the confinement boundary, there are emergency action levels that drive the emergency plan to um, go into effect and the licensee will make um, mitigative response to that. Same with the spent fuel pool. It, it doesn't matter the cause of the event, it's the results of the event. If there's an issue, an event that happens that causes a reduction in the coolant level, you know, loss of level, loss of all cooling, there are emergency action levels that would go in, be, um, triggered basically to cause the emergency plan to go into effect and the licensee would perform their mitigative actions using whatever their plan procedures are, whether it's their uh, mitigative strategies, uh, their extra equipment, uh, the diesels, the fire hoses to try to get water on it, that. So it, the emergency plan, it doesn't, it's not specific to 
an event, it's specific to the results of that event. Answering that, Mike. We have a few more questions that are inside of the audience. Give me a few moments because I want to stop sharing the screen so we can get the opportunity to have all the face-to-face -face engagement. There is a hand that I saw raised earlier. I want to be certain that the person has raised their hand. Was there a comment that you've already provided in the chat box? Because I was going to read those first, and then I will go to those whose hands are raised. There was one more question that I thought I saw. The question by Larry Camper and asking about an overview of the proposed changes for security and EP in the ongoing decommissioning rulemaking. He wants to cite the proposed differences for the basis. Which of the members of the NRC staff would like to address that question? I can go to the slide that we have already prepared for the comparison if you'd like me to do that. Um, I, this is Mike Nars again. Um, to be honest, um, I believe, and I'm not an expert on the decommissioning rulemaking, that uh, it for, with respect to emergency planning, what we are currently doing with the exemption process and have been doing since 2014 is consistent with the ongoing decommissioning rulemaking. With regards to security, this is Doug Garner. To date, we have not received a re licensing amendment request from the licensee to modify the security program. I think that question. I know that there's a few comments that's in the chat box, so I'll ask it for you to bear with me as we go through and I read a few of them. At this time, I will have a member of the public whose hand has been raised that I noticed previously come up. I will have you made a presenter and unmute you at this time. Ms. Susan Leffer, please let me know if I pronounced your name correctly or not. You are now unmuted. So if you're able to speak, I have unmuted your line. Let me try this one more time. Ms. So Lover, you are unmuted. You can now push the mute button yourself. I have unmuted you on my end. I'll move to the next member whose hand has been raised. Roger Witherspoon. I have now unmuted your line. You can unmute yourself and ask your question at this time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, um, thank you very much for hosting this. While the plant was operating, there were problems with breaches in its in the communications of its security staff. Um, have those been addressed or has that responsibility been shifted to whole tech? And if so, have they found the cause of the intrusions and blocked them? This is Anthony Dimitriotis. I think I could take that one. Uh, I'm aware of a, of a number of instances where that happened during an exercise. Correct. And, and correct, yeah, that has been addressed. And I think that wasn't like over a long period of time. But yes, that, that's been corrected. And uh, of course, that would be Holtec's responsibility at this point. At the time that you're referring to, the licensee was Entergy, and now it's been Holtec. But they have corrected that? They have... Um, as, as far as I'm aware, yes. Did they find who was intruding, or did they simply block the intrusion? I don't know if they uh, found who did it, uh, but they did block the uh, the capability to do that. Thank you. Without getting into details. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for addressing that, Tony. We do have another question that's inside of the comment that I see from Dave Lockbone. 
my apologies, the screen moved on me. Without naming sites, what kinds of EP and security findings at decommissioning plants have NRC inspections identified? Thank you, Tanya. Uh, so I saw that uh, question by Mr. Lockbaum. Good question. I'm not aware of any uh, EP findings in Region 1, at least, which is, uh, I'm a branch chief, uh, with oversight for decommissioning reactors. But for security, uh, there's been a, a number of uh, uh, violations. We don't we call them findings as a number of results, not as part of the reactor oversight process that we administer for operating reactors. But for security, to make a long story short, there's been a number of uh, violations that we've identified and the LIC has addressed uh, in accordance with the corrective action program uh, as mandated. Uh, one it was related to uh, intrusion detection and alarms and so that that's one thing that was addressed another one was related to weapons of uh, maintenance uh that was not done properly um and i think that they're the two major things that we we've, uh, we've seen and uh yeah that's basically the the two groups of categories that we've seen there hasn't been a lot of those but i would say the less than a handful Thank you so much for addressing that as well. Going through the comments, let's see that there's another hand that was raised. I'll try to go back to the hand that was raised at this time. I will raise you up to be able to unmute Tina Bonger. If I have not pronounced your name correctly, my apologies. You are now unmuted. You can speak at this time. Yes, hi. Um I would like uh, somebody at the NRC to address this issue, which is uh, that we have found that the whole tech workers who are doing the decommissioning have not been trained in a gas pipeline emergency. Um, and it's of grave concern. And um, we voice these with the decommissioning oversight board, but I'm wondering if somebody at the NRC can address this. Tanya, I could take that. Appreciate it, Tony. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, for a rupture, uh, a pipeline rupture, of course, is uh, would be very serious, and we anticipate that not to be happening. But uh, your question related to how the workers at the site, whether they be whole tech or or contract workers at the site, how what training they would require is not. Uh, Right now, uh, it's not part of the requirements that we uh, we have our licensees do. Uh, of course, they do have general uh, emergency requirements, and we we would look at those so we can look at those during routine inspections. But like I like it was said before by Mr. Norris, uh, the general uh, emergency uh, response would is is hazard oriented, and uh, you know we certainly want our licensees to. Uh, have their workers uh, have people be ready to respond to some emergency like that. But of course, that would be a very extreme case. I and we don't expect that to to be, you know, uh, a normal thing, of course. It, it's, uh, but uh, we, we can take a look at that to see what uh, uh, emergency uh, response uh, training the, the workers would have, like, to uh, you know, evacuate the site and, and things like that. So we can take a look at that. May I ask another question too? Uh, may I ask another question too? Yes, sure. About, okay, so you know, there's many of us in the community who feel like we need a written um, protocol from um, that involves the uh, possibility of a gas rupture and then also radiological release. And I understand that the risk is a lot less but we on the ground here, I can see Indian Point from my second floor window, you know, we don't have um, a, a plan, um, a community plan or anything that's been communicated to us um, about a, a, a protocol in case there's an emergency. So I, I, I really, you know, and I, and I understand that this is a regulatory, you know, uh, chaotic mess um, and, um, but I, I want to keep, uh, you know, keep it front of mind so you know what kind of advocacy we need 
here in this community while you're doing the decommissioning. I mean, there are all sorts of aspects of this that are, you know, that really feel, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's no oversight in a sense of, of what these emergencies are. For instance, you know, we know that Indian Point shut down during Sandy, right? Um, but we don't know if that's being, if that's something that, you know, that there's mitigation for, like, has there been any mitigation for that? Is there really any mitigation when Indian Point was a target 9-11? So those are the major, I, I just want to tell you what are community concerns here in looking at your emergency plan, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So we don't operate the facility. We regulate. We're, we're, uh, we regulate the facility for the work that's being done. And as regulators, I can tell you that the requirements uh, to uh, have, uh, you know, plans for like typical that would be from an operating plant are not required for a decommissioning plant because the the uh, the hazards are so significantly reduced. Having said that. Having said that, uh, there is no uh, uh, obstacle for the decommissioning board to, uh, you know, connect with Holtec to to have something like that in effect. Uh, going back to your other question or comment about there's no oversight, there absolutely is oversight. My staff and I know uh, Jesse's staff and, and Sean's staff have a very strong oversight uh, of the facility during decommissioning. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that we work very hard to make sure that that is done effectively. Uh, Jesse, did you want to add something? Yeah, if I may, I just wanted to, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, it, uh, you know, my branch, I oversee these uh, technical reviews. They are complex. And I wanted to say that uh, we um, uh, have very knowledgeable individuals that look at these analyses and evaluate them uh, and, and are very um, diligent in what we do uh, in ensuring that uh, these sites, whether it's a decommissioned facility, whether it's a, a wet storage, dry storage, dry cast storage, or even an operating reactor, uh, they, are, uh, they have the capabilities to uh, mitigate and uh, conduct and ensure emergency preparedness plans are effective. So I just wanted to say um, to let you know that uh, we we do look uh, we do look at this. We scrutinize the analyses, and I just wanted to 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 reach out to you to let you know that uh, that's what we do here at uh, headquarters for these license reviews. That's all. Thank you for that, Jesse. At this time, we thank you, Ms. Bronger, for your. Comment. I'm going to take a few moments and ask members of the public that are currently on the phone for your opportunity to comment. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand by pressing star five. Once I identify you, I will give you the opportunity to have your mic unmuted and then we will move on with other comments or questions at this time. So let's take a few moments for members of the public that are on the line. You can press star five if you are currently on the phone. That way we will get the opportunity to know if you have a comment or question that you would like addressed. Okay, seeing none this time, I'll bring Ms. Ellen Weiniger. If I mispronounced your name, my apologies for that, to ask the question that you have at this time of the staff. You're currently unmuted. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to comment and thank you for the uh, opportunity to view this uh, important webinar. Um, appreciating the comments that have uh, been made and presented about emergency uh, for, you know, first responders, emergency planning, um, uh, you know, we're in un charted air, uh, area here with uh, decommissioning at a nuclear facility that is the only nuclear facility in the country that has um, three massive large diameter high pressure gas 
transmission pipelines traversing the property. So uh, right there, we have a unique situation and emergency planning that may normally be in place for other nuclear facilities uh, simply doesn't uh, necessarily apply here because of this uh, dangerous co-location of, uh, of these hazardous uh, uh, kinds of infrastructure. Um, and one of the things that you know, has been mentioned is that uh, even as decommissioning is uh, proceeding, that there aren't even any markings of the pipelines and the right of ways so that various um, decommissioning activities can go on uh, uh, either within a right of way of the pipelines or even in proximity to the, those right of, uh, rights of way. And um, even Enbridge um, in its own, um, you know, uh, uh, materials uh, mentions uh, the importance of uh, oversight, yet there is none on site. Um, and also in PHMSA's uh, guidance, they actually uh, indicate that operators must control construction on pipeline rights of uh, right of ways and ensure that they're carefully monitored to keep pipelines safe. I mean, this is, you know, the convergence of decommissioning and pipeline infrastructure with uh, pipeline ruptures being, um, according to PHMSA's uh, data, uh, not uncommon, and especially in newer pipelines. And there is a new, new pipeline that was constructed at that location back in 2016. So again, I appeal to you uh, to uh, address this unique situation and not using the template of these other facilities that you listed, like uh, Pilgrim and Vermont Yankee and um, the other ones uh, that you had on one of your slides, because this is different. And indeed, the emergency instructions for residents conflict with each other and are really leave uh, residents in uh, a totally unprepared and dangerous situation. So um, if you can answer that question in terms of how will you approach this unique situation, uh, it's unprecedented. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, I just wanted to mention two things about the pipeline. One is that the NRC has done two separate reviews of the pipeline, one in the 2013 timeframe and again in the 2018 timeframe. And separately, uh, right now, or in the recent past, the Department of Transportation, which has uh, the authority to uh, about pipelines such as this, is actually uh, doing a study right now, and it's uh, hoping to release their results in the uh, in the in soon in the next six months. So it's it does not fall in depth. We've done two separate uh, detailed inspections specific to the plant, unrelated to Pilgrim and other sites, uh, and we've had the results. The first ones uh, were questioned, and so the NRC initiated another review about it. And separately, of course, our Office of Inspector General did the same. And separately, after all of that, we uh, the Department of Transportation was also asked to take a look at this, and they're looking to issue their report in the in the near future. So I'm Carl Sturzbecker, and I'm the project manager for Indian Point. Uh, and this concern we started last year when we have our weekly meetings with uh, Poltec. We have a line item that they discuss with, uh, with us, what work they're doing near the pipeline. And they have a procedure that we have set up where they have to talk to Enbridge. And, and you know, we, we have those discussions every week or every bi-weekly now. So that's uh, another item. I mean, that's been a year now that we've been monitoring this, so. 
Thanks, Carl, and, and, th and thanks for that question. And, and uh, we apologize if the slide comes off as if it's, you know, it's just a similar uh, review, but every site, you know, is evaluated on their own merits. And, um, you know, we are hearing your concerns, a lot of concerns there related to the, you know, the, the pipeline itself and potential ruptures and making sure there is some type of, um, uh, you know, communication to the community in terms of where are some of the act actions that should be taken if there is an, an, an event. And that's something we can take back to some of the state and local contacts that we have um, uh, that we communicate with frequently with the agency so we can make sure we communicate, relay the concerns that we're hearing today. It's time. Do you want to move on to the next uh, question? Yes, there's another question that has been asked. How often does the NRC visit sites during the decommissioning process every year? I guess I could that off. Um, yeah, so the decommissioning uh, activities are related. Uh, the, the frequency of our, our visits and inspections are related to the risk activities that are actually going on site. Um, as they're actually undergoing physical decommissioning, the inspectors are there extreme, much more frequently uh, than if they are just at an agency site with um, not a lot of activity going on. However, they are still providing frequent monitoring throughout the, the life of the license. Uh, and Tony's online. So, Tony, you want to jump in on that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, the number of visits, so our inspection activities are commensurate with the risks uh, that are associated with the actual decommissioning. So what's decommissioning? Decommissioning involves dismantling and taking apart the, the site, right? And so when they uh, when the site uh, initially shuts down and starts planning the decommissioning, there may not actually be a lot of physical activity. So uh, our reviews are typically, uh, may not be on site as much as when they're actually cutting and, and, uh, and dismantling certain things that involve radioactive materials. So it does vary. So it depends on what's happening on a given week or month or things like that. So early in the process, there may not be a lot of on-site inspections. There might be, there's a lot of review, of course, and, and a review of their plants and things. But as the site begins to dismantle, cut the reactor vessel internals and things like that, our, our uh, inspectors are on-site more than, uh, than other times when that, that activity is not done. Now, it's important to also state that, you know, we, we are not there the same as we are at operating reactors where we have resident inspectors. However, that's been deemed that uh, this is what we think that is appropriate uh, given the risks associated with the decommissioning. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much for answering that, Tony. We do have Ms. Susan Leifer, I believe. If I've mispronounced your name, my apologies for that. You are now unmuted. You can ask your question at this time. Susan, you can unmute yourself. Susan, I'm not certain what device you are using. It seems like you're on a laptop. There is a mute button that's next to you at the top. It says mic, if you can use that. If not, we can move on to the next question. I'll give you a few moments to try to locate that. We'll come back to Ms. Susan again. We have Marilyn Eiley. You're unmuted at this time. Please share your question. Marilyn, are you able to unmute yourself? You are unmuted at this time to be able to ask your question. Let me move on to the next one. Give me a few moments. Let me go back to the chat. See, was there another comment that has been asked? Yes, Ms. Glidden, the link, there will be a link available and provided when the meeting summary is submitted so that you can get access to the slides. They're currently available on the public meeting website and we'll have the link available when I provide the meeting summary for this meeting. Question is asked here is Does the NRC work with the county, who we are told will be in charge of the emergency regarding shelter in place versus evacuation? Does someone at the NRC staff like to address that question at this time? Can you repeat that? This is Mike Norris. Can you repeat that again? Does, does the NRC work with the county, who we are told will be in charge of emergency 
regarding how to implement shelter in place versus evacuation? Uh, not really. The offsite protective actions to the public are either a county responsibility or a state responsibility, depending on the state. And the NRC is only um, a, their emergency plan only really addresses the on site. And we relieve, you know, we we respect the the authority of the off sites to protect the public. So no, we don't we don't tell them what to do. We have guidance for you know recommended uh, shelter versus um, evacuation, but that that's just guidance because it's all under the authority of the off site air authorities, not not the NRC. Mike, would it be fair to say that uh, the uh, an evacuation or sheltering would be very, very remote uh, a chance in a decommissioning site? It would be for a radiological release at a decommissioning site because all the studies show that we the any release would be very small, if any. So yet yeah, there. It wouldn't be a it would be a very highly unlikely event at a decommissioning site versus a, a reactor. Thank you. You mean an operating reactor? That's what I said, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. At this time, we'll go back to those that are in the attendance that have their hand raised. John Sullivan, you are currently unmuted at this time. You can unmute your mic. Hi, I'm the person who asked the question about the NRC working with the county. Uh, just I want to just expand upon that a little bit. As people of the NRC probably realize, we are in a very heavily populated area. E even though it's an unlikely event that there would be a large radiological release, um, what we get from the county right now is just like a trifle that says, don't worry, we'll tell you whether the shelter in place or, or evacuate. Um, I could just see chaos, you know, it would be impossible to deal with this. Um, so I would encourage the NRC to work very strongly with Westchester County about guidelines. Uh, I'm assuming it would have to do with weather as well as what the event is. Um, so I, I just, we had a DOB meeting, the county kind of stepped up and said, don't worry, we'll take care of this, but we've yet to see anything uh, provided in detail other than this general trifold that they hand out every year. It says, don't worry, we'll tell you what to do. So um, I think we feel a lot more comfortable if the NRC was really involved with Westchester County to delineate what happens in an emergency in terms of sheltering in place and evacuation. Thanks. Thank you for that. Do we want to expand any further on the comment that has been addressed? We have answered the previous question. Is there any other expansions before we go on? Because I'll go back to the phone lines to see if there's anyone there that would like to ask a question at this time. I would just say thanks for that. And, and as I mentioned before, we can take that back and share with our, um, our state, federal, and our, our, our local um, stakeholders, especially around the Westchester County. We can definitely do that. And, um, and we did have a comment, Tanya, if you wouldn't mind just repeating the instructions for those that are on the phone. Um, yeah, there may be a couple of that just when it, there may be by phone not be able to see this uh, visually. Yes, that's what I was going to do at this time. I was trying to get a few people that I've raised up to see if they were able to get back online. But for those that are on the line, if you want to participate in the meeting, you can raise your hand by pressing star five. That will let me know that you have a question or comment that you would like to ask. At that time, I will open up your microphone and you'll get the opportunity by pressing star six to unmute yourself. I'll wait a few moments and go back to Ms. Susan Lever, see if you're able to find the mic. If you're on the computer, Susan Leffer, you can click the mic button. It should have a line across it to show that it is out. That way you can uh, unmute okay. yourself because you are unmuted at this time. I'm I unmuted. Okay. Thank yes, you. you are unmuted. Yes. Okay. I have been listening to this conversation for 
multiple years, and it seems that no one has ever addressed this. When my gas company sends me a notice, it says, in, in, in light of, if, if you smell gas, run. Take everybody with you and run, and then make a call. If you have a big community, there's no place to run. And I don't understand this department, when 9-11 went down, the fire department couldn't speak to the uh, other departments. It made life much worse. It made many more deaths. The idea that this isn't a, a, a known configuration of how all of you uh, react to this, it's so frustrating. And I, you never even send information out that if a double accident should happen, what should we do? I don't think the people at the plant know what to do if there's a gas pipeline. It's, it's all vague. This department does it and that department does it. I'm sorry to sound very irritable, but this has been a long, long time. And we have never, never got answers. I was told years ago that uh, Pace and, and a few other colleges, if there was a nuclear accident, would would uh, on the twelve since they're twelve miles, they would take people in. I went and talked to these colleges, and they didn't even know what I was talking about. Oh well, we have a gym so place. I said, do you have bedding? Do you have food? Do you have water? No, we don't know what's happening. It's all. The fact that too many departments are taking care of this means that there's a lot of information that's falling between it. It's very frustrating, and I do not understand how it's possible that you are going to figure it out on as the accident is happening. Thank you, Ms. Leffer. Give us a few moments so that we can address that question. Is there a member of the staff that would like to address the question at this time? If we can get a, 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 a this, Tony, uh, I thought that maybe if uh, the, the young lady could ask us uh, the, the question directly. Obviously, there's frustration and that she uh, um, expressed, and I, I get that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what the question is regarding. Is it uh, the, the wishes to have some direct uh, direction? in the event of an emergency that Enbridge could provide and how, I'm not sure if it's a question for the NRC or for Holtec or for the owners of the pipeline. I'm not sure what the... I like to think to just make a, a quick statement. Overall, there's general concern about what to do in the case of an emergency. So that you're aware, Ms. Leffer, the NRC is in conjunction with the state, with the county, and how to prepare for emergency evacuations. It's not something specific that we can address just on what we do alone at this time, but there is coordination that does take place. What we can do is locate, because there's several other previous discussions that we've had related to this, so we can coordinate, get a response to you, and I can have that in Mail to you. We do have your email address because you're participating in this meeting and we can send you some information at that time because it's a coordinated discussion that will be able to address that we aren't able to address in this meeting at this time to give you a complete answer. We do hear your frustration. We do acknowledge and appreciate you participating in this meeting to give us further insight about how you feel as we move forward through emergency preparedness. And at this time, I will pause for a few moments and give another instruction because we're getting close to ending the meeting. I want to ensure that we have members of the public because I want to ensure that you are able to unmute yourself again to raise your hand if you are on the phone. Press star five at that time. I will know that you want to ask a question. I will then unmute you so that you can ask your question of the staff. I will go back to a previous member that was if you're able to unmute yourself. Tina Bonger, you still, your hand is still raised. I know you asked the question previously. I will unmute you at this time to see if there's another question. If not, we will move on to the next person. Thank you so much for being in the meeting. Susan, I mean, my apologies. Tina Bonger, you are unmuted at this time. 
Did you have another question you wanted to ask the staff or was your hand still raised previously? Okay, hearing none. Let me move on to the next person that we have listed here. Marilyn Eiley, I'm going to unmute you at this time. If you are able to locate your mic to see if you can have a conversation at the top of your screen, if you're using your computer, you should see a little mic with a line through it. You press that line, it will unmute you. Marilyn Eiley, you are unmuted at this time. You're able to ask your question of the staff. Okay, Marilyn, we're having difficulty getting you the opportunity to be able to ask your question. Please type your information in the chat box. I will move on to the last person that I've seen. Roger Witherspoon, I'm going to unmute you at this time. If you have a question you would like to ask of the staff, please ask your question at this time. You are unmuted. Thank you. Um, the comment that one of your colleagues made about the relative danger of the spent fuel pool now that the operating reactors shut seems to contradict the 2001 study that the NRC did on the dangers from spent fuel pools, which found that the contamination was far more extensive than any in just a, uh, a working reactor. So I'm a little puzzled by that statement that the danger has been minimized. Would you please elaborate? Very nice. Yes. 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 Is this the 2001? Is this the study that's in the slides? What slide would you like me to go to, Sean? I'm trying to see if he's looking, referencing the slides. Is he still on the phone? The 2001 study? Let me bring him back up. I think slide 14. Roger, is this? So we were trying to hear you here. There is a little, a little bit of feedback in your, in your information. If you can make a concise statement or type in your specific question if there's a slide that you're referencing because it is difficult to hear some of what you're asking. It was not a slide. It was in response to a comment by one of your staffers that the danger of radiological contamination was diminished because the plant was shut. That is not the findings of your department's 2001 study of the dangers um, from spent fuel pools. Um, Tony, I think I was a part of that. But I'm not sure, not sure. That I recall the study that you're, you're referring to in 2001. The, the statement that we make about the, uh, not the dangers, but the risks associated with operating reactors versus decommissioned reactors is about overall risks and radiological releases, uh, large radiological releases that would uh, necessitate uh, emergency response and things like that, uh, about evacuations and shelter in place and, and sodium iodide pills and things like that. So that I do stand by that. The, the risks associated with contamination, uh, it, about risks of spent fuel pools is a different issue, I think it is. But I don't recall, I don't know the study that you're referring to would help if you could uh, maybe give us a, uh, a specific uh, pointer as to which one you're referring to. And this is Mike Norris. I can I can elaborate a little bit further. Some of the, the regulatory analysis that was done in New Reg 1738, which was the basis for the 2000 decommissioning rulemaking, indicated that the NR, we, we could the studies could not determine a time at which a zirconium fire could not occur based on the um, decay of the, the spent fuel. So based on that study, we incorporated a 10 hour time frame. In other words, the fuel has to be cool enough had decayed enough, uh, you know, the period of time to decay that there is 10 hours 
from the time at which all cooling is lost to the spent fuel pool, spent fuel to initiation of a zirconium fire. And what that 10 hours allows, it allows for the time for the licensee to perform mitigative measures using the mitigative strategies type of equipment, the pumps, the fire hoses, the alternate water sources. So as part of the exemptions that have been conducted since basically 1999, one of the criteria that the licensee has to meet is the, the spent fuel has to decay to such a point where if it loses all cooling, there's a minimum of 10 hours at which for the licensee to perform mitigation to prevent the fire. And we have to understand really what has to be done to mitigate, you know, th that fuel from going to a zirconium, you know, to heating up. And it's basically just providing some type of cooling, you know, sprays, extra water in the pool. And that's what the mitigative strategies equipment that we're that we require the licensees to have by a license condition, and it's actually codified now in the regulations. That they have the equipment, the capabilities, the training and the personnel to perform the mitigation of this type of event to provide some type of cooling. So that study, the new reg 1738, that's that's how we took that information and we added additional criteria that the licensee had to meet for us to grant the exemption. And that's the process that we've used since 1999. And the later studies, the new reg 2161, that basically just validated that successful implementation of the mitigative strategies was um, reduce the likelihood of that event happening. For answering that, and Ms. Glidden, I just saw your comment. That question, the slide was showing an extended discussion that was previously asked. We will have a meeting summary that will come out that address. It is difficult for us to type all the responses that are being provided inside of this meeting in the chat. We do ask that you have the information in the chat so that we can have a if there's a specific question that you have that we can address at this time. I do have one other individual that I know that has had their hand raised. Please, Ms. Eileen, I'm going to make you a presenter and if you can unmute your mic. I know you were unable to locate the mic button previously, but I see that there's been some assistance from the staff. You're unmuted at this time. Ellen Weiniger, I'm mispronouncing your name. I do apologize, but you are able to unmute yourself at this time if you'd like to ask your question. And for those that are on the phone, we do ask that you press star five so that you can raise your hand and I will know that you want to have your question or the staff address at this time. And then we will begin to start closing the meeting. We're getting close to time. Ellen, are you able to speak? Yes, I time? am here. Thank you very Thank much you. You're welcome. You for the opportunity to uh, pose an additional question. I did make a comment in the chat uh, that I uh, hope that the NRC can address, um, and that is uh, more recent studies um, that were conducted at Princeton by uh, Dr. Hippel, uh, Frank von Hippel and Mark Schopner, Dr. Mark Schopner regarding cooling pool fires. And those uh, studies demonstrated that um, there is potential for quite significant radiological releases um, that would cover a very wide geographical area uh, in the event of a cooling pool fire and indeed uh, would uh, release more radioactivity than a reactor meltdown that would render uh, tens of thousands of square miles uh, essentially uninhabitable. Um, these studies were conducted several years ago um, something uh, like this uh, could occur in the event of a pipeline rupture or for any other, you know, any number of reasons. Again, uh, whether 
or not a facility is, um, has operating reactors or not. Um, the cooling pools um, hold uh, uh, vast quantities of um, uh, spent fuel. And um, I would appreciate uh, your addressing uh, the studies that were conducted in, um, at Princeton regarding this issue and actually um, di in direct opposition to what you just said earlier. Well, again, this is Mike Norris. Um, again, we require the licensee as part of their exemption to maintain the equipment, the personnel, and the training to perform the mitigative actions that would be required for any event that would result in the loss of cooling of the spent fuel pool. So that that is a requirement. It's required by their license condition and it's required by regulations. So they have the equipment, they have the people, and they have the training to perform mitigation of a loss of cooling of the spent fuel pool, no matter what the cause is. So, and if and if there's anything that the licensee is not able to have, he's got letters of agreement with offsite response organizations, fire departments, et cetera, to respond to the site to provide additional resources if they need additional hoses, pumps, whatever they need. I mean, that that's part of the emergency plan. It's the on-site capabilities as well as the off-site response to the site. Thank you so much for answering that, Mike. I do not see any other comments in the chat box, and I do not see any other hands raised at this time to answer a question that has been asked. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available for the public to be able to go back and review. The NRC staff will answer the questions that we see. If there's information that is already in coordination and collaboration with other government agencies or state bodies, we will have that information addressed at a later point to provide you. This time, there are no other final comments, questions, or thoughts. I want to direct your attention to the fact that if you have feedback for this meeting, you can send that information to me at tanya.hood at nrc.gov, T-A-N-Y-A dot H-O-O-D. Tony, would you like to have a question? Yes, I, thank you, Tanya. Just a, a comment. Uh, there is a comment regarding uh, uh, from Miss uh, Marilyn L. Uh, my mic has been disabled by the program. Uh, we try to work through that uh, question. Please be more specific about the procedure the NRC is, uses to ensure safety, especially in regard to the pipeline. I think we addressed uh, that the NRC has done two separate studies, plus the IGs was also part of the NRC. It's a third one, and now the Department of Transportation is doing their study. Uh, so I think that addresses that. And when the when that report is issued, hopefully it'll, you know, it, it'll be made public, obviously. How often are your inspectors on the ground? As I said, it varies. Sometimes it's a week a quarter. Sometimes it's a couple of weeks a quarter, depending on what the, uh, the, in, the activities that are happening on site. As I said, if they're not, if the licensee workers are not doing physically like uh, risk significant activities, like cutting the internals of the reactor vessel or other things, right, grad waste and things, then we may not be there on site as, as often as other times. So it does vary, but we're there typically, typically, uh, you know, at least a week, a quarter, sometimes more, typically more because there's activities that are happening. Uh, let me see, are you relying more on reports from paperwork? We do both, we're on site observing activities we interview licensee personnel. We have uh, uh, conference calls uh, and regular calls with individuals who work at the site. And we also review uh, incident reports, uh, procedures, documents, surveys, all kinds. So it's all of the above to answer that question. The information has not been transparent. Actually, it has. We actually uh, issue our inspection reports in the public and we issue them through listserv and we can certainly direct your attention 
at Adams, if you do a search, you can see all the inspection reports that I've signed out in the last three years for, for this site. Uh, how can the public be better informed about this process? Well, this is one of the forums that we use to engage with the public to make sure that we get our message out about what we do. We try to make it uh, uh, very pointed depending on what the issue is. In this webinar uh, that Sean and Tanya are hosting, uh, we try to focus on, on security and EP. Next week, we have the decommissioning oversight board, which will be doing uh, some uh, focused uh, discussion on ISFAC, the spent fuel. So that's one way. And also you can go to our website. There's a wealth of information there. Sean. Thanks, Tony. Um, and, and thanks for your, your participation here. A lot of questions on the inspection side of the house. Um, thanks for the, the, the insert staff in terms of the security and EP. And, and thanks, Tanya, for hosting and everyone else that uh, might have missed, missed here. Um, I, you know, there I just put in the chat just the opportunity for anyone to sign up in terms of um, getting on the listserv for a lot of communications that Tony mentioned related to the plant specific activities. Um, <clears throat> we'll definitely, as Tony mentioned, we want your feedback in terms of you know how you all like this uh, this session itself. Um, we do uh, plan on considering additional um, information se sessions on, on different topics and definitely a lot of questions about the pipeline and we will take that information back and share it with our uh, state and federal colleagues in terms of the questions and concerns that were raised here and, and is that for, for everyone to remember <laughs> sorry we do have the December 7th New York State Decommission Oversight Board just because there's a lot of questions related to Indian Point and we will um, be participating in that meeting as um, Tony said so other than that just thanks for your participation so thank you for that and with that for the members of the public as i stated previously they will be meeting summary developed from this that can give you the information and the link that will be provided that gives you the recording for this information we will do what we can to capture all of the comments and questions that have been asked on this meeting and if you have some feedback or something specific you can as i stated previously send that information to myself tanya.hood at nrc.gov and we have done a great job, gentlemen. I appreciate it of recapping. I do not have to do a quick recap of all of what has been done. I truly appreciate that. And with that, there are no other final comments, questions, or thoughts. We can close the meeting. And on one moment. Thank you. Sina Bonger, the question about FEMA, I think we've addressed that question previously as well. There's a lot of information that is available on the NRC's public website. We do our best to ensure that we inform the public of a lot of things. So some of the questions that you're asking is already available and addressed on our website. Information about FEMA. Let me go back. With the NRC, share, the pub share with the public how FEMA is involved with their emergency planning process. We have about two minutes. We do have consistently coordinate with FEMA. So someone would like to answer that question really quick, and then we can close out this meeting session. Yeah, this is Mike Norris. Um, for an operating plant, uh, the NRC works hand in hand with FEMA. Uh, again, the NRC has the authority on site. FEMA has the oversight, if you will, for the off sites. As part of the decommissioning, as part of the actual exemption process, we do consult with FEMA. We do get their um, comments on our uh, commission papers that we write. However, it's the NRC's authority whether we grant the exemptions or not. And once the exemptions are granted, once the licensees met the criteria to implement the exemption, then we provide a uh, written notification to FEMA that there's no longer off-site radiological emergency preparedness required, and FEMA will let the appropriate governmental agencies know that. Thank you so much for answering that, Mike. And with that, we thank you so much for participating in today's public meeting for emergency preparedness and decommissioning security. We thank you for your time and wish you all a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.